This is Dr. Chris's Radio Horror Program here on WCOW 91.3 FM, and this is the 13th anniversary show of Radio Horror. 13 years ago, one of the first guests, the first actor I ever had on Radio Horror, uh, came on the show, reached out to his manager, and he was quite surprised who anyone had reached out to him to, that wasn't didn't want to talk about soap operas or General Hospital or 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 anything like that, but a 1980s TV series which is finally coming to DVD in France, but might be available in the United States at some point, or you can order it. I think it's really complicated because I don't speak French, and a lot of the jargon I'm trying to read online is uh, badly translated. <laughs> but Werewolf the Series is finally coming out at some form or another, and John J. York has come back on the show with us to uh, talk a little bit about what he's been up to the last several years and uh, a little bit more any factoids about Werewolf we never talked about before. Thank you for coming back on, John. Appreciate it, Chris. Good to, uh, good to be here with you. I want you to know that I'm counting on you to get me some kind of link or some phone number or, you know, whoever I need to call in France, because I definitely want to get my hands on a series, you know, a, a set of those DVDs. Nobody... I was, I was going through some old boxes. I can't even find. I can only find a couple of VHS tapes, and I know that if I pop one in my uh, VHS machine, it'll probably snap right away, snap the tape, because they're so old. Uh, I didn't realize it was released on VHS. Where was it released on VHS? Here in the States? No, I mean, I recorded it when the show was airing. Remember way back when, in 1988, 1987, 88. Um, and I just recorded the shows as they aired. And I had them, and I don't have them anymore. I don't know where they are. I have a couple episodes somewhere. I have seen for years the uh, like the convention like bootlegs and stuff like that, which were always interesting, but they're really bad quality. And apparently, I guess this French release is going to be of like the best quality that they can come up with. Well, I hope so. You know, and again, I hope that uh, you are my go-to guy. <laughs> Phone number, information, email address, whoever I can contact. My hands up. So. I, I will. I will do my best to reach out to the French. Did you ever have any involvement with that Scream Fact or Shout Factory release that never happened? No. No, I just did the show, and uh, we wrapped it up in December of, I believe it was 80, was it 87, is when we were filming the show, or did it, and yeah, it aired in 88, so uh, we finished wrapping it up in 87, and uh, that was the last I heard of it, and we were, in fact, at that time, we wrapped the show December of 87, everybody in Hollywood kind of shut down for the holiday break. And when we came back, the new year in 88, the writers went on strike, and that strike lasted for eight or ten months. It just it lasted almost the whole year. It really kind of turned Hollywood upside down. And in the meantime, we were waiting for a pickup for Werewolf, and we didn't get one. So the show wasn't picked up. There was a writer strike, and life got turned around for a few years. And then... In 1991, fast forward a few years, my wife got pregnant, and I started auditioning for General Hospital and started work on the show in 1991. There was a, you know, what it was years later. I found out there was a, uh, there was like a comic book too, which was interesting. That has to be probably the only piece of merchandise ever made for the show, which is unfortunate because the werewolf itself lends itself to be like a statue or an action figure. You know? Exactly. I couldn't agree more. In fact, if you think about it, werewolf was way ahead of its time. After Werewolf came Buffy the Vampire Slayer and all these other horror-type genre television shows, and Werewolf, as great, as great as it was with the effects and with the stories, I mean, Werewolf was basically, was kind of like The Fugitive and The Incredible Hulk, you know, got mixed up together. So, you know, I... I, I was given the curse in the original pilot episode and then spent my time traveling and moving around the country looking, trying to trace the real werewolf, uh, was Chuck, played by Chuck Connors at the time, and uh, never found him, never lifted the curse, found out in the end that he wasn't the end of the werewolf line, and, you know, so I'm still looking for him. So the, the short story is I'm still a werewolf, <laughs> never lifted the curse. You just hide it very well on General Hospital? Yes, I do. I chain myself to a post here at home. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to get into the weird and kinky stuff that you and your uh, wife are into. It's okay. <laughs> We we had posted that you were coming on the show again on the uh, there's an a, there's like a werewolf TV show group and one person asked um, what how did you guys do the pentagram on the hand trick 
uh, because the, uh, the 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 level of bonus material that will be on this DVD set is probably pretty scarce, and they definitely have not interviewed anybody that worked in special effects. The uh, pentagram on the hand was one. There was two different ways that I recall. One was a simple just drawing of it, you know, where they would draw it with the, the makeup on the palm of my hand, and I would turn my hand and reveal the pentagram, which started the metamorphosis of, you know, change. And then the other one, which was a little bit more elaborate, was a patch that had tubing underneath the patch, and they uh, glued it to the palm of my hand. The wire ran underneath my arm or up my clothing, and there was a special effects makeup guy off camera that, as I, as Eric Cord, uh, you know, felt things were happening, I would turn my hand over, reveal that the pentagram was starting to form, and then they would squeeze the blood through the tubing, and it would, you know, slowly come through the little pinpricks in the pentagram that was glued to my hand. One of the uh, biggest superpowers of the 80s was probably the amazing hairstyles, and you definitely rocked it out on that TV show. Yes, I had big hair, and still do, except now my hair is gray. <laughs> so, uh, actually, my hair's a little bit shorter now. And, um, yeah, I did I did have some big hair back then. They, some pe people on General Hospital still say, you know, John, you've got great hair. <laughs> so I'm blessed. My dad had great hair, so I think it's... Uh, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. But werewolves are supposed to have great hair, right? It's not always supposed to be so shaggy and ugly and disgusting. Exactly, right? I mean, come on. If you're going to be a werewolf, you've got to be styling. Did they ever tell you, like, how the show was going to end if they ever got there? Never did. They never said anything? No. Nope. I was, you know, I was an actor with my first big break in Hollywood, uh, you know, working on a series and having a blast working with uh, David Hemmings and James Guerin, um, Frank Lupo, John Ashley as the producers. Frank was the creator of the show. Um, you know, I, I rarely, if ever, saw Frank. I'd see John every now and then because he would come onto the set and make sure everything was running smooth. Um, and the directors were fantastic. David Hemmings basically uh, directed almost every other episode. James Guerin directed quite a few, more than any other director. Um, but yeah, you know, no, I just got my scripts, came to the set, lock and loaded, and we did our work, and we worked basically from, I would say, 5 o'clock at night to 5 in the morning, or 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning sometimes, with werewolves, most of the shows were done at night, so they were, you know, we required nighttime shooting, so that throws your sleep schedule off quite a bit, but we got through it, we managed, and we had a great crew and a great team, um, everybody worked really hard. We did, we did the first two sets of shows. That, you know, we did the pilot, which was considered three. So I think we did 20 or 21 what would be half hours, and the pilot could be considered three. So then 18 episodes. Um, I'm sure maybe somebody that's more deep into the show will correct me if I'm wrong. But I think we did, so probably 10 in the California area, and then we moved to Salt Lake City and did the last group of shows in Salt Lake City. Did you ever get to go to the convention circuit with this show in any way? Because I know conventions in the late 80s were very sparse, especially in the horror community. They didn't really blow up in the horror community until the 90s, but... Right. No. Uh, didn't know anything about them. No one ever made contact with me, and uh, that was that, you know. That's a shame. I guess, you know, yes. <laughs> I know that we had some uh, we had some three D buttons. I still have my hands on one or two of those where you know you, you, you just shift it slightly and it goes from my face to the werewolf's face, which was kind of cool. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things, just a couple of posters that I still have up in a room somewhere. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just not a lot of stuff. We just did the show and moved on. Lance Legault was Alamo Joe. He's out there somewhere working. You know, I haven't really stayed in touch with Alamo Joe, Chuck Connors. I think Chuck has passed it since the show was on the air. And there you go. You know, here we are. Fast forward. How many years now? 87? So that's a lot of years gone by. Yeah, 87. Uh, it's a little over. It's about 33 years since the show started, I guess, since this is the 2020. Right. Yeah. Do you do you ever hit like the gen? Is, does does soap operas have conventions? Do they? Because I don't know anything about that world. I've I've stayed out of it. Let me tell you. 
We do, we do. Um, there's a, a terrific uh, company run by a girl named Linda Rowe, and she uh, grabs handfuls of actors, at, you know, at least from General Hospital, and I know she works with actors from other shows, and even other, you know, uh, com comedians, people like that, and she sets up appearances for us in different cities, wherever they are, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, uh, Atlanta, wherever, whatever city she's got lined up, and we go and we uh, sign autographs and talk to the fans, and you know, I got to say, I, I had a blast on Werewolf. It was a great um, first big step for me working on a television series. The General Hospital was the biggest blessing of my life. You know, I mean, it was just, it's an incredible job. Uh, my, my daughter, my wife was seven months pregnant, eight months pregnant when I started auditioning. And I started the show January 14th, I think, or 13th, and three weeks later, my daughter was born, and here we are, 30 years later, still working on the show, and it's a, it's changed over time in terms of the shooting schedule, how much we shoot, how much time it takes, the uh, size of the crew, but it every time it takes on a different, it morphs into something else, everybody adapts very well. And General Hospital is just, I got you know, it's the greatest, it's just the greatest show. It's the greatest show on TV. You've got to be behind the scenes. You've got to see how hard everybody works. Um, and every show does that. You know, I played golf today with some guys, and they work on NCIS. And, you know, they talk about their great crew and their great team. And to have a great show, and NCIS has been on forever, you know. You have to have that for any great show, whether it's Friends or anything. I mean, I go back to the Dick Van Dyke and Andy Griffith show, I'm sure. You have to have a great group of people that love what they're doing, that love coming to work, uh, that all get along. You know, there are no egos. And um, we get along and we get the job done. And it's a lot of fun. When you were doing the um, when you were doing General Hospital and uh, the conventions, was there constantly like people like me who were more you you would uh, spot you more for uh, werewolf than than knowing anything about soap operas? Um, a lot of people did mention werewolf. You know what I mean? Not not that they. I think there may have been one time in my life that I kind of somehow remember that someone knew me from werewolf, but they didn't even know that I was on General Hospital. You know, and that that was just that maybe visiting a town, you know, going to Vegas or going to Chicago, you know, where my family lives, uh, or uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, I have family there. You go up, you go to the mall, you know, you, you're going somewhere, going horseback riding, and someone recognizes you. They're like, you're the guy from Werewolf, you know, but I'm on General Hospital for three or four years, you know, so that, that may have happened a couple of times. But mostly now, and for the longest time, it's just been from General Hospital. It's funny, there was a girl just the other day, where was I? Oh, I was going to mail some letters in the post office box, and there was a line out the door, and I was standing there, and I asked somebody a question, and, and this girl, and I had my mask on, of course, you know, so you could really just see my eyes, and I had a visor on, and she said, you're Matt Scorpio, aren't you? I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> well, how can you tell? All you can see are my eyeballs. But she was a linguist, and she recognized my voice, and that's the short story of a longer story. But it's interesting. It's interesting. The fans—they're—they're they're dedicated fans. Great, great people. You and Bill Bigsby probably walked the most miles in television ever, maybe because of the amount of times you guys were just like walking and walking. Was it the was it the same area, just filmed differently for every episode? No, we were in a lot of different locations. Um, I will say, I mean, we were out in the Valencia area for something on, on the track. I mean, the, the, I don't even remember the names of some of the episodes, but uh, it was it was by a train track. You know, I was walking on the train tracks, and it was that was out in Valencia. We were in Malibu, uh, at Mal on Malibu Lake, which is just a small kind of a pond. You know what I mean? It's, you don't think it's some big lake or anything. But we were just on location all over the place. We were on location in Salt Lake City, all over the place, whether it was... Uh, industrial type park, you know, buildings or abandoned buildings, or uh, there was a fair, you know, out in a, when it was shut down, and of course the um, set people lit it all back up when everything closed down at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, because we were then filming until 6 in the morning, but it's been a, a, like an outside shopping type mall area. Um, where else were we? Oh, we were down in San Pedro for the pilot. 
you know, working on these old ships that were abandoned. I mean, it was really cool. It was really cool. We worked on a lot of cool sets, a lot of cool places. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Sylvester Levy, I believe, was he the music guy? I'm thinking back now during the credits. I, I think so, yeah. But, uh, yes, I agree. In fact, there was one show... What was it? Oh, it, we, were out, we were out at the Disney Ranch, which is out in, like, Santa Clarita area. And we were on location. And it was just like this mystical... It was a mystical show. Anyway, I don't know the name. I, you know, I'm, I'm lost here in memory, but I, I just remember this one. B.B. Astrowalt, I believe, great New York theater actress, was uh, one of the guest stars, and I believe it was this episode. And at the end of that episode, the music was so phenomenal. I wish I had a recording of that. It was so... It was... It was Sylvester Lemmy, but it was very Patrick O'Hearn. You know, it was it was just really, really cool. Like I said, I think the show is way ahead of its time. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't know how I don't know how it would do today. I guess it really depends on what network it's on, what streaming service it's on. Every time you think that a show is going to do well on one network or streaming service, it gets canceled, and you're like, "Why did that get canceled? What what was the reason or something?" But you know, also they would do the werewolf probably in CGI, which would be a big disappointment unless they can make it look amazing. But the the practical effects of that show were really great, and CGI was not a word that existed other than unless you were James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, or George Lucas. Right, exactly. You know, and they did they did it with the real costume. You know, uh, Greg Cannon was the makeup artist. Rick Baker, uh, Academy Award winning makeup artist, uh, film makeup artist, special effects makeup artist, great guy. He designed the original werewolf costumes and suits. And then I believe handed, handed the day-to-day -day work over to Greg, and that's how we got it done. You know, he set up all the different, um, uh, you know, layers. So, you know, you, you, the pentagram was the beginning, the first thing to kind of turn up. And then, depending on how much time we had in sh shooting the show and what the plan was for each episode, maybe you would, you would see the camera would come up to my face and you would see me shaking, you know, and shivering and starting to change in slow motion with the music and things going on. And then the camera would either pan away and then when you come back, maybe there was some, what are they called? You know, the, the, just a slight change of uh, special effects makeup, patches and different things on my face, maybe add some hair. It would be two or three different levels. I think the farthest level I ever went myself was prosthetics, face prosthetics, you know, some things that they put on my face with the hair and um, the contacts, different con like yellow eyeball uh, that turned my eyes different color. And then as soon as, and then they'd cut back to the victim, and then when they'd cut back to the werewolf, now all of a sudden you would have the stunt guy in the actual werewolf costume coming up from behind a couch or behind a rock or from a tree. And it was all done in slow motion, and it was all with the music, like you say, and the fog and the mist. At any point, did you feel like they were ripping off the Incredible Hulk a little bit too much? Because, again, you pointed out the werewolf would come up behind the couch, and I always remember, in, uh, you know, several episodes, Bigsby would get punched, he'd go flying over something, and then Lou Frigno would appear. <laughs> right, right. Now, the only, my only question about the show, I didn't, I didn't think, you know, who knows, it was what it was. But my question is, where did Eric Court get all his clothes? Because every time I turned into a werewolf, I ripped out of all my clothes. So, you know... And then when I turn back into myself, I'm naked. So then I got to, where's my knapsack? Where's my bag? It was handy all the time. <laughs> so that was, that was my biggest question watching the show. Wait a minute, where's this guy getting all his clothes from? Is it like Optimus Prime's trailer in Transformers? He would transform and the trailer would just disappear, like drive away, and you're like, where's the trailer going? Or it's like all of a sudden the trailer just appears. Right. <laughs> And with that, at least you could say, oh, well, he's a robot, it's remote control, so it's in storage. Okay, it's off camera, we don't need to animate it coming out of the tunnel, or whatever, right. that's fine. <laughs> right. But, yeah, you're right, that would be like a continuity error today. People would, like, rip apart on the internet. It's like, are you kidding me? Just, like, in the next scene, after he's, like, he wakes up from being, like, naked in the woods, he's automatically got a knapsack and clothes, and it looks like the same one that he left behind. Did he retrace his steps after grabbing some clothes to find his knapsack? 
the question still looms. Was there anything that you wish you you still had today? I heard somebody found the werewolf itself, like the werewolf. Uh, there have been pictures posted of the skeleton of the werewolf. I'll tell you what I might have, because they did a cast of my teeth for the fangs, you know, when right. they uh, come up. And I may have those somewhere in a box, in a drawer. Over the years, my lovely wife, we have collected quite a few things. <laughs> so I wouldn't even know where to start. wouldn't even know where to start looking for them. But they may be somewhere. I may have the fangs somewhere. That'd be interesting. You should definitely uh, take a picture of those and uh, post them. Right. Or if you ever need, like, a payment on the house, you could definitely be like, all right, these are going for sale. You know, that's why, two reasons. I mean, I don't even know if my daughter, to be honest with you, who's going to be, uh, she's turning 30 in February, but I don't even know how much of Werewolf, well, we really didn't watch when she was a kid growing up, because she was born, and I, I started General Hospital, and General Hospital has been her whole life. So she may has, have seen an episode or two, just in passing, but we re really never looked at anything. But that's why I want to get my hands on a, you know, copy of, of the series, if I could, the whole series on the DVD, because I'm sure it'll be in great condition. It'll look fantastic. And I want to hand it down to my grandson. You know, he's three years old, probably going to have to wait until he's maybe five, six or seven before he can really watch an episode, even though it is dated. But, um, you know, wouldn't want to scare him, but it'd be pretty awesome for him to see, oh, that's my papa, you know, doing being a werewolf. Who were the stump, stump people that uh, that did the werewolf costume? And did you ever want to try it at least once to see if it could fit you, or do you, if you could do it, or was that just not a contract thing they could do? I don't need. I don't think it was a contract thing. I just think it was a safety thing because the werewolf um, did a lot of stunts. You know, it was jumping around and flying around, and I just think they wanted to. It was also very heavy, very bulky, very. And it would have been, you know, may maybe a lot of wear and tear on the actor, Steve Boyum. Steve Boyum was the stunt coordinator, but I don't believe he ever wore the wolf suit. We had another guy, I forget how many, so long ago, I forget so many names. But there was just a stunt guy, you know, that always wore the wolf costume. So that that's it. I don't know I don't know why that was chosen to be that way, but that's how it was. What was the best place that you went to when you were uh, filming? What was uh, one of the best locations that, that you had? Wow, that's a good question. You know, like, what was the food like? What was the people like? Because, you know, when, when a production when a production company comes to a small town or whatever, you know, they really try to get the locals involved because it helps their economy. Well, the, the production, the food that I that we ate mostly was uh, catered, you know, that was on the set. We'd get to the set in the morning and there'd be breakfast there, you know, out of the catering truck. And the food was fantastic. And when we broke six hours later for lunch or dinner, whatever it was, I mean, it was steak and lobster or you know sometimes lobster some salmon but there was always meat and fish and chicken and pasta and three four five different types of salads and so the food was fantastic um, the hardest thing for me would have been and probably and i'm sure my wife as well was when we went to salt lake city we were in a hotel for you know two and a half three months whatever it was just different than being at home you know, it's just, I, I, I never had spent so much time in a hotel before in my life, and I took a, you know, I, I think I came down with a really bad cold, and of course you're in a small, a small area, and you know, it's just, I don't even, I think I worked those whole last episodes sick with a cold. We had a lot, just all, all the locations were fun. Some were bright and shiny and lovely, you know, like the Malibu Lake area, but most of them were dark, and dirty. There was a, an episode called Nightmare at the Brain Hotel. I believe Richard Lynch, if I'm, if I'm correct, was the actor in that one. He was phenomenal. And I mean, we're just down in a empty, abandoned building in downtown L.A., you know, and it was kind of scary to be in this area. But we had security, and of course it was the 80s. Times were different then, so it seemed like things were safer. Uh, let's see. Yeah, other than just being in the hotel, which was you know, not something that I would look forward to. There was an episode, I think it was called Grey Wolf, where we were out in the valley and we worked with a dog. You know, I got to work with kids, I got to work with dogs, I got to, I got to work with everybody. Did, uh, is, uh, how many episodes of General Hospital do you film in a week before the pandemic happened? The show has changed greatly over the past, since I've been on it over uh, 30 years. I will say that we take scenes from 
anywhere from it, it could be three to five shows out because they they have to be very efficient with time. So if they have scenes with certain actors in, let's say, the police department set, okay, that the, the PCPD, the Port Charles Police Department set, is up, and they know that it's going to be over three episodes, maybe five episodes, they will try to have all those scripts written and write those scenes so they can bring the actors in either on one day or two days in a row to take scenes from three or five shows. You know what I mean? Then they can take that set down and put up another set and call in the actors to do those scenes. So, you know, back in the day, we were probably shooting, I would say, five episodes a week, um, possibly scenes from six. But now we're shooting scenes from, gosh, I mean, it could be six, seven, or eight shows every week. Maybe not a complete show, but, you know, they put it all together in uh, post, in editing. The production really has to be on their toes to get the show out and to have it look as great as it does. And it, it's it's really amazing the hard work that goes into making a show like General Hospital and the, and the, and people because it's really they've cut down a lot. Um, everybody is really safe, you know. They've got great protocols, wearing masks and spacing and you know distancing with people. Um, I, I really feel very comfortable when I go to work. What, and how does that compare? How did that compare to uh, doing Werewolf, which was a uh, weekly, uh, a, a, you know, a weekly show? People do ask that a lot, or they they did ask that. The difference between General Hospital and Werewolf was, I would say, lighting. You know, when you're working on a daytime show, or even let's say a sitcom, a three camera show, something like that, you have you're you're doing it with video mostly, even if it's film. You're inside, you're on a sound stage, and you've got three cameras, so you can do different shots. You can do a wide shot and a close-up shot and kind of get everything done in one or two takes, and you're moving on to the next scene. In film, like with Werewolf and maybe uh, uh, you know any other of the nighttime dramas that are our shows, they do what's called a wide shot, a master shot, and that's you see the world. You see the buildings and the people and the extras and the cars and the lights and the street and everything else. And then they slowly come in, and they move in tighter and tighter and tighter until you see those close-ups that the audience sees on camera. So, you know, it's and, and then they have to change the lighting. Every time there's a new shot, they're tweaking the lighting, and they're fo- refocusing the camera, and then they have to reload the film in the camera. So the simplest point I could make is, when you're doing General Hospital, it's really at a fast pace. We do the show, you know, it's done very quickly. Doing Werewolf was very tedious, and sometimes I would wait an hour, hour and a half between takes because they had to change the lighting. So you do a, you know, you do you do the scene, cut. Okay, go take a break. Redo the lighting. Okay, it's thirty minutes. They say we got we need thirty minutes. By the time it's all said and done, it's been sixty minutes. You know, so you're just standing around waiting, and that's why it takes 12, 13, 14 hours to do the show. And I, I prefer, personally, I prefer the speed of daytime. I prefer the technique of filming a daytime show. Werewolf was mostly at night. Oh, if how did that kill your sleep? Did that kill your sleeping schedule? Yes, it threw my body way off. I'm a, luckily, I'm kind of a nap person, so I would, you know, close my eyes on the set for take nice, quick, short power naps, 15, 20 minutes, and get re-energized. But you do what you got to do, you know. I was young and had a lot of energy, and, and we got through it, it was, and it was very exciting. You know, I mean, I was never a big horror film type person, you know, and I just I just never was. I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, I grew up, my favorite shows was the Dick Van Dyke Show and the Andy Griffith Show. So there you go. South side of Chicago is my home. Mm. What's 30 years, or have, you, or have you worked on anything else, or does working on soap opera not allow you to do that? No, you're able to do things if you can work it out with the show, uh, depending on scheduling and, you know, different things like that. But yes, I've had some, you know, I've worked on a couple of uh, low-budget films. Uh, One aired on, uh, was on the Lifetime channel, I believe. Uh, So, you know, a couple of things here and there. Some films, a couple of guest stars and co-stars on television shows. But, you know, nothing to write home about. 
You know, I, I think it was, you know, I'll say it again, I think it was way ahead of its time. Um, so much time has passed to where even if somebody had the idea, I, I believe Fox, probably 20th Century Fox, owns the rights to the show. Oh, then that's, oh, then that means Disney owns it, because Disney owns all of the media properties of Fox. Really? Well, that's, a, yeah, you're, now you're in the weeds where I don't even know, what, you know, who owns what, what's going on where, but, you know, let's just say all this time goes by, because the show never really, they never, you know, tied a knot and you know sent it on its way the show is still wide open eric cord could still be out there you know is now now eric cord is the head of the werewolf line you know and and then and some other young kid is doing the things that i did i mean you 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 could you know literally reopen this can of worms pick it up from where where it left off but only 30 years later could be interesting but again it's above my pay grade the sc- I'm such a collector of scores and soundtracks. That would be something I would definitely pick up. Um, is if they ever release like the score or soundtrack. But what's funny is, is that music is what's held the show up for, for. It's what canceled the entire Shout Factory box set back in 2009. Wow. Yeah. Pretty amazing. It's it's un it's unfortunate. Do you uh, keep in contact with anybody, or do you, have you uh, run into any people from from the show that you uh, work with? No, I have not. You know, uh, there's there's one uh, guy. Uh, his name is JP. He was a uh, a the first AD on the show, and then he directed a few shows. Um, we get stay in touch every now and then, but you know that's a that's a birthday call kind of thing. You know, maybe get together, and nobody's gotten together for anything since this COVID thing has started. So, yeah, I'll see JP every now and then. But my, the only social media thing that I have is a, a Twitter account, and I think it's at John J York. <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming back on the show to talk a little bit about uh, Werewolf. And again, uh, I will, uh, you know, keep in touch, and I will we'll see about getting you a set. All right, Chris. Well, so nice talking to you. Stay well, and um, stay safe. Stay away from the werewolves. Definitely.